Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to see new faces and uh, also very familiar faces. Uh, thank you, Alan, for organizing all this. And yeah, very happy. I see faces I have seen since 2007, seven, <laughs> and nine, and then 13 and 15 now. And a lot of new faces also. I, I think uh, there are maybe <coughs> 10 of you that I didn't know before, and it's very nice to have you here. So, welcome everybody. <laughs> very happy to see this. This is, uh, I think, uh, always the conference have. I have seen always between 30, 35 people, so it's very nice to have more than 50 this time. Perfect. Um, so the, the, uh, my first presentation is about, uh, it, it says, what's new since the last conference? In, in the conference on Krefeld, uh, 2015, I I showed the things that were new on Edempier since uh, we started. And the idea here is to show what's new since 2015. So I was, these days I have been uh, creating the list, but it's really long, <laughs> four years, and a and lot of new features. So at the end I <coughs> selected, I, we have made four releases since the last, the last time was September 3 and the list is too long. So I will try to show some specific things very, I, I think they are very important and maybe you don't, mm, some, some of you don't know they exist. Um, I, I, I would like to, to do a bit uh, of research first about, about the, the people here, <coughs> what is the, the, the interest, yeah? So I identify like two types of uh, interest from persons on the community, yeah? One is implementers. I think, uh, I think that's the biggest part of the community is companies that implement Edempier for other companies, yeah? So I am one of those uh, two. Or companies that help other companies. And there are also a part of the community that are end users, companies that use Edenpure by itself. Maybe they sometimes call for help from implementers or maybe sometimes they do it alone, yeah? So I would like to know how many of you are the first is manager, owner, or partner of an implementer company, yeah? So one, two, three, four, five. And for 15, yeah? So we are here like 15. And. So, sorry, I am also part of that. 16. <laughs> 16. <laughs> I, was, I was just reading what are the other ones. <laughs> okay. And, and also, yeah. we have <laughs> 17. <laughs> uh, Developers on these companies, see? Four, five, two, six, six or five, I, I you can see. There are other roles here? Testers, functional, document, functional, yeah. Nice. 
One, just one, two, three. <laughs> oh, but you are manager, yeah. <laughs> you are also owner. So you were in the first group, yeah. Yeah, you, usually the first the first group is also the third. It's very common. And uh, and about end users, there are here manager owners and user companies. Yep. Seven. Yeah, yeah. Usually, you 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 are implementer, but you also use Edenpure. And developers from end user companies. Two. And end users. End user, user. Uh, Herbe? Yeah, there is a intersection there, but I will take it. There, there are freelance developers here. Four. And somebody that was not counted before. <laughs> ah, Frank. Yeah, kind of what I expected, yeah? yeah? Most people here are implementers, helping other companies to, to do. Yeah. And we all know that is implementing it. And PR is not easy, and most companies require some help. And we are to help them. <laughs> and some companies uh, are brave enough to do it by themselves. <laughs> and it's nice. <coughs> okay. Mm, mm, I, I wanted to do this uh, mostly also to now where, where to focus uh, because the list is too long. So I will try to show uh, for implementers, which is the biggest group. Yeah, there are many new things that help a lot to implementers. There are also a lot of things for end users, but I think uh, we have uh, uh, created many tools to make the implementation easier, the migration, implementation, keep it in PR going, yeah? So let's, <coughs> let's start. Uh, in case anybody is interested in a specific topic that you now exist but don't understand, you can ask me and, and I will tell. I will show things that in, in the last version have yeah, or surprised me or I think they are things of big interest, um, especially for implementers, I think. Let's, let's talk first about uh, functional. That is, the, the list is, a lit, uh, is not so long in functional terms. We have, yeah, we have made a lot of things, just that functionally speaking, uh, I think Eden Pierre evolves more functionally in plugins, yeah? So the core evolves technically, architecturally, and functionally, I think we evolve more about the plugins evolving, new plugins or the plugins being improved. Yeah. In the core, I think uh, Marcus Bosem added IBAN support and OSGI interface for payment exports, which is very interesting. We implemented generic conversions for unit of measure, and Adaxa contributed revenue recognition uh, that was was there but was incomplete. This one is documented on the wiki, the others too, no. Okay, so let's talk about the things that help with the implementation. Um, technical, let me put this here, in the technical side, 
when you come here. When you come here, you see um, <coughs> here, that's common, the number of connections to the database, how many connections are busy, how many connections are idle, etc. Yeah? The type of database. When you run a process, let's run, for example, this. Yeah? So this is something we added um, to, to, to check the um, connections to the database, is this, yeah? So when, when you see there are busy connections, one connection is busy, normally you can see here a list of what every connection on the database is doing, and we try to give proper names to make it easy. So it's the process running is synchronized terminology, and it started one minute ago, yeah? The critical thing I think this is solving is that it was very difficult uh, in past to find, um, you are, everything is okay with the microphone here? Yeah, okay. Uh, <coughs> in past, it was very difficult to find connection leaks in the database. That, that's very difficult to trace. And it's very easy to do a mistake in the code, not closing a prepared statement or something like that, and, and you have a connection leak, and your Postgres is locked because you consume all the connections. And it's very hard to trace, yeah? Or it was very hard to trace. Now, now I think it's very easy because when you have a connection leak, it's very simple, you have this list growing. You have 500 connections in Postgres and it all, all the connections are consumed and you see the long list here. So if you click on this link, we show approximately where was the statement that is not closed, where, where it was open, yeah? So it says here, the last time it was open, and you can trace here, ah, okay, this synchronized terminology in this line 65, and I can go to Eclipse, yeah? Go to the line 65, and it says, ah, okay, this is my statement that most probably I forgot to close this or for any reason it's open and I can get right to the point where I need to solve this problem. It's, I think it's now very easy to find where are my connection leaks, yeah? And, and we created this because it's a very common mistake and it's very common also question in forums, how can I find, or wh why my connections are getting, yeah? It's very easy now with this tool. So we created that. Um, so, sorry, may I ask, uh, this is the application server level. This is not possible to see all servers together. If you have multiple application servers, I uh, Yes, I, 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 I have not here, um, I, I am running here just one note, yeah? The last month, I think, Hensing has created uh, multi-node support in this page, yeah? Hmm. But uh, I am running here the development, so if I would have several nodes, it, uh, it would appear here, but I am just running one. But uh, Hensing has improved this, adding for example, you can take the logs from all the nodes. You can see cache from all the nodes and reset the cache from the nodes. Hmm? I, I have not tested because you need to set up a Hilario. 
uh, you need to set up an environment with uh, several nodes, and I have not done. Sorry? Will it work, Dean is asking, uh, will it work on 3.1 version? No? 3.1, no. no. This, is, uh, this is development, so what I am running here is like 7.1 that is coming maybe next week. <laughs> it's usually released on Halloween, but today we are not going to release it. <laughs> <laughs> we are busy. <laughs> a bit busy. Yeah? In Idle, Idle show this? Uh, you mean this? <coughs> oh, 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 what do you mean? Uh, which transactions are not wor working or? Uh, Yeah, usually you see here, when you have a problem with a program not closing the transaction, you can see here, I have seen servers with, where it says start time two days ago, so you know there is a problem there because <laughs> some program started and never closed the, the program. Uh, this here is about the connection pool, yeah? We, we, we have a connection pool. You can configure the number of connections. So by default, I think it opens 10 and then shrink to 5. And it uses a connection anytime it's needed. And these are connections that are available, but not, not working. Yeah? <coughs> this, this is very recent, added also by Hensing. Uh, you know the <coughs> cache and cache reset has been always like, yeah, we know there is a cache that reads from database, put in memory, and it's there for consuming. But Hensing added this that shows what is in the cache of the server, yeah? And how, how big is this? Uh, we have 1,762 messages, and in the cache we load every language that you have, so you can see. And when you do a reset cache, what happens here is all these numbers, size, uh, size goes to zero because we reset cache and they wipe the contents, but not the cache keeps there, and it gets used again. I can do it. Uh, let me do a reset cache here. Yeah, and all this comes to zero, except the message because probably it's it loaded to to show this message. It, 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 the program resets the cache, load the message again, and very fast. Um, this was added very recently by, by Hensin, in multi-node support also. Okay, so I, I like this a lot for helping to find. Ah, I was showing you this. Uh, some of the, some of the features I used to document here, yeah? I try to create um, pages in Wiki with the name, with the category new features, and we categorize by features that appeared in the version 4.1, and we try to save some um, categorization if it's functional, user experience, technical, etc. Um, but I am almost the only one doing this with BigRid. If the community helps uh, with uh, documenting new stuff, yeah, and new features that uh, are, are appearing on Idempeer. 
And there are a lot that I have not had the time to document. So there are a lot that are, yes, there. <coughs> OK. Most of these technical stuff are helping implementers to, to, do, it, to do things. Yeah? This is also nice. I am just j jumping in, in the list. Uh, so there is a new feature that I like a lot also. Um, you know this here. This here used it to be a hard-coded form that use. We just had this list of before there were five there, and it was fixed, and you cannot add or change things there. Yeah, so this was from Adaxa too. Yeah, uh, Adaxa created a way to to configure this, you, there is a window called document status. And you configure a query. What is the query? Uh, here, the where query. Which table, which is the where clause. Yeah? And you configure also some which font I want to use, font, color, etc. Yeah? And when I click on this, yeah, there are nine activities. If I click on this, which window uh, to open when I click there? Yeah, two notices. So, so this is very nice because you can now add per uh, for your implementation a specific new. Um, uh, document status. So we we use the name activities because it's, it was the name before. But yeah, this is more like a list of documents with some status or whatever. You can put anything there. I think it's very. Uh, it makes it appear more configurable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This also, this came from, I am mentioning, in, in case you don't know these features, I, I am mentioning some interesting uh, styles and fields. This is something we wanted to do and we didn't know how to do it some time ago. And with Trek Global, we defined a way to do it. So. It's a <coughs> it's a new window here. Mm, CSS style where you can define. You, you know when when you are creating idempiere, you have a CSS files with the styles of every field, every type of thing here, but. Now we can add a specific style information to a, to a field, yeah, into a label of the field. So for example, here in the, in the wiki says, I want the document to be yellow when the status is draft, yeah? And in the window, i.e. in the field, there is a new label style and field style. So I just point there, and this is the result. Yeah. So I think now makes the windows more. Um, all, all of this is, we, we say, user experience. Yeah? To make the user experience easier, uh, but to make it easier for implementers to provide that, yeah? We, we do the tools, and implementers use it for the users. 
almost in, in the core, we add many things to the core, but you, you don't find very many ex examples of that in Core, yeah? It's things that you use in your implementations, yeah? Mostly. <coughs> Mm. In grid. How will be seen in the grid mode? Uh, yeah, it looks, uh, it, it works also in grid. Yeah, we have added that also. I don't remember if there is a problem because it takes the, uh, just the first and color all the lines, but I think we, we solved that. I don't remember. Hmm. <coughs> This is, this is, for example, wh one of the examples that I told you. We implement that the, the feature is there, but we are not using it. Yeah? The... Uh, we created the ticket, committed the, the code, but we didn't tell anybody what was that. And Murilo, <laughs> Murilo came and did some tests and posted this, this one here. That shows um, what's the idea, yeah? So you can now have, oh, you can now have in a window, this is a normal window, yeah? This is order, you have uh, order source cars plan nine, and you can have a detail within the window, yeah? So it was a way that we thought to create master detail relationships within a certain window. You, you know we have, uh, you know we have a strict, let's say it's like this. We have a strict master and one detail is shown here, yeah? And if you need to see the second detail, you need to go here. But with this functionality, this one, yeah? You can have several details in the same master and have them in line, yeah? So in instead of having here order line, you could have it here like a box. Order line, and here you can have another box with order taxes. I think that is uh, that is how many other software looks that they in in one single window they combine master and many details. So we were trying to provide a feature to to do something similar, yeah. Yeah, they, they combine in the same window, many Maybe details. Now they should be nice uh, to decide when you define the application dictionary. It's the standard le legacy, uh, master detail, or this new way. That would be the approved. Uh -huh. You can define, okay, I would like to see all, but inside, in line. This is like in line master detail approach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's defined like. If I am not, it's like a new field. You you add like you add like a new field. So as you are adding a new field, you can position it in, on the window. Yeah. So you you say the the lines come here, but the taxes come here. So you can use the field positioning on the window to use that. <laughs> Included tab, uh, kind of, yeah. But uh, I think we also added some call out, call outs be because this is a field. So we added some call out that we can trigger a call out when you do a change on the field. Yeah, we added that. So if the user clicks here, cash plan line, in that moment we can trigger a call out and do something on the master or do something on another detail, whatever. Yeah? Uh, both. 
there are read only and read write. It says read only, but when you when we made it is I don't know. I think it's read I think it's read only, but it, it has the call outs is to select to select uh, rows. Hmm. Okay. Ah, this this one. Uh, you know from version 5.1, Hang Sin made uh, a lot of changes to make this more compatible with <coughs> mobile phones, yeah? Ah. So it's like this. When you starting from here, I think, yeah, from here, from the login, uh, uh, Hansen made this. You can hide this, and you can now log in on a phone because previously was very difficult. Yes, yes. No, it's already there it's since uh, 5.1. Yeah. It's fine. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that idea I want to show you here is things, but there are many things that we created and maybe we didn't document or we nobody talks about that. <laughs> The idea would be we need to document it to make it easy for new people to use it, but we, we are still not. Okay. So, this is a phone, and you can now use user, password, language, login. In the window inside, it's very different here because the menu comes uh, in another place, yeah? And you select, what is this here? Sales order. And now the window is, how is this called? Uh, responsive, it, it adapts to the size of the window, yeah? And you can, you can now use Idempere on a phone, but not the special clients. It's the same CK client, yeah? But it's useful on a phone or better in, in a tablet, yeah? <coughs> it uh, adapts better to the size of the window. Uh, we have not tested this, but I, I, I think it's possible to create um, forms that are responsive like this. So you can create, for example, we have not done that, but a point of sale or forms for Salesforce automation that they use on, on phone or tablet. And you configure something like uh, we have already open automatically this form when somebody logs in. So I think uh, it's possible to write, say, K code to use on phones. OK? <coughs> this is a feature. I don't know if you, if you know it. I like it a lot. <coughs> yeah? The detailing sum detailed sum across. You know this bottom from from forever is there <laughs> since George Young. Ah, where is my it is? Yeah, you I use business partner. 
So when I am in a business partner, I can look here. Where is this business? Where is this business partner used? Yeah. This is how usually looks. Yeah. This business partner has one contact, one invoice, one project, blah blah blah. But there is a new feature here: preferences. Mm. That I said detailed zoom across, yeah? So it's per user. Each user defines if they like it or not. And when you come here, then the list is so. It's like when when this is disabled, the thing is like the algorithm is to look some windows on the first tab that are related to this business partner, but just on the first tab. So if the invoice cust customer is in the business partner of invoices, yeah? If I say detailed zoom across, it goes deeper, yeah? It goes to the second and third tab to see um, connections. So, for example, something we didn't have here was um, sometimes requisition. You, in the line, you have the business partner, so you cannot find with zoom across the second uh, the second tab relationship. So now, with the detailed zoom across, is it goes deeper, and it finds many relationships. But we make it configurable, and not the default because the list becomes sometimes the, this list becomes too long and the users maybe don't understand what is <laughs> but I, I, sometimes I feel it's like uh, tools for us the implementers to to use or for advanced users but it's not for every user I think it's, uh, it's too long sometimes here the list <coughs> Okay, I like that. Um, another feature here in preference two is find similar to. Another preference is here. It says use similar to. This work just for Postgres, not for Oracle. Yeah, and is that Postgres has a. Uh, A way to say C or P, yeah? For example, uh, yeah? So it has every business partner that has C or P on the name, yeah? These kind of queries are advanced queries, the, the end user will not search like this. This is like more for us, that you can uh, have or, uh, it's not a regular expression, but it's almost a regular expression, yeah? You can you can find more things and um, I, I use this a lot. For example, in sales order, when you have a list of five numbers, you just put them, yeah, here. Like that, yeah. You to do that search in the normal way, you need to go to advanced and start document this or document this or document this. So here is very strict. And yeah, and there are more operators for this. You can find here PostgreSQL is similar to. I think there is documentation about this operator. The how how to create patterns there. <coughs> mm, when you enable this similar to, what happens in inside Eden Pierre is that every like in the code, yeah, document number like this is translated to similar to this. Yeah? So that sometimes create problems. 
Now I cannot find things with a parenthesis, yeah? I cannot do this search. Because Postgres says, mm -mm, you have not closed the parenthesis. Yeah? So it's because now I am using similar to instead of like. And we are, we need to be aware about how to search. So this is not for end users, more for helping us when we, we are using the system. Okay. Um, this four that comes there. Now let's talk about this first. Inline HTML fields. Uh, anybody? No. This. We talked a lot about this. About this Murilo. Murilo created some code. He added. I added more code. And finally, we, we found that any text field, we added this flag HTML. And when this flag is checked, the field is rendered as HTML. Bef before this, I don't, I don't think, if, if you remember, this was like uh, showing the HTML code here, yeah? And uh, yeah, we, we changed this. Now we can show HTML within a field directly. Yeah? And uh, when you click on a field that is HTML, automatically opens the HTML editor too. Yeah? So let's see, for example. <coughs> Mm. Ah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So it's as simple as just clicking here, HTML, yeah? <coughs> For us, the implementers, it's just clicking there, cache reset, and now this field is HTML, yeah? <coughs> And it's shown like HTML. Before, before it was like HTML, uh, B, bold, and yeah, it was not nice. Um, Talking about the, the, the differentiation I made at first, yeah, this that I said, implementer companies and end user companies, yeah. Uh, Murillo, I think, uh, he, he, he has mentioned the special case, yeah. It's, it's also, it's also a implementer company but sometimes they don't use the ERP at all, yeah? It's, it's using idempiere as a development framework to develop anything, yeah? Not, the, not invoices, not orders, yes. So Murillo has brought also many things that help uh, with the development and makes easy things like that. <coughs> So I show it inline HTML field, and 
we added this also virtual UI column virtual UI column is because of this yeah uh, you know in past we had virtual columns that's since compare times uh, virtual columns is that you can have for example th this was real in product window in the product window you had a field called cost standard yeah and in the window we have this query select round from m cost blah 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 and it went to m cost table summarized the current cost price and show it in a field yeah this was terrible idea for the database yeah because many times uh, uh, in ma in many implementations i remember uh, people saying the product window is terrible it doesn't open or it takes five minutes to open yeah and we always end up dis disable this field yeah just disable because uh, it was and it was not just for the window it was terrible that any time in code you look for a product it created this same query on m cost yeah so it was nice but you you cannot use it when, when big tables or things like that so we talk about this also and said we can create a virtual column that is not read on the dat on the database every time we read products but just when you are showing the product in the window yeah and it's just one time so when i when i look at this product it goes and do the query and shows the cost standard but just for this product ah that's the other problem yeah the the query was not just for one product it was was for 53 products yeah in a table with millions of records maybe m cost so it was terrible this virtual ui columns is the same virtual column but just the query is just for this record so it's not consuming the database resources yeah and it's <coughs> this one doesn't work in the grid mode? Yes, it works in grid. Mm. Or just for the page of the grid? Yes, yeah. I think I think we 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 also at first we solve uh, we work it just in one row, but I think we fixed that. And it's very simple to define a virtual ui column we use the same way you we use it but prefix with sql yeah and the virtual ui column use it to join with the parent table so now we are is doing a query with the context that's the difference to write the virtual column we use the same way that you use it for col for virtual columns, but if you say SQL, it means it's virtual. Yeah? And with this virtual columns, now we are, be before I always said, everybody, I said, don't use virtual columns hmm. everywhere. But now I say, yes, use these virtual UI columns. And we have made interesting things combining virtual columns with HTML, yeah? So you can show fields, very nice fields here. I don't remember. In buy-in we made a field, uh, for example, in Business Partner, you can have a field here with the, all the orders or the top 10 orders of the customer and in HTML and you can have links that you if the user clicks and make zoom yeah combining the virtual column with HTML 
and combine it with the styles. You can put colors on the fields. And just configuring, yeah? You don't re need to write code for that. So all this goes like related to create windows. And so, uh, just for information, the post just started, you'll have the generated codes, calculated codes. <coughs> Not the same, but uh, maybe in some use cases can be. Generate? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Ca uh, calculated columns uh, is a feature of post. Yep. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, no, there is another change, yeah, because before it used this notation <coughs> and you need to change to context. Okay. Hmm? Okay. <coughs> um, Nicholas added this. Placeholders, yeah. So we added, but we are not using it <laughs> in Korea. Yeah? Um, so it's here in field. You see, when I am in a column and want to see the fields, I need to come here. But I like this preference. Yeah? I think with this preference, we don't need all this use it in field, use it in parameters that we used to have. We just go there. Um, here, yeah? Nicolas added this also for users. Enter a brief description of your oh, again here. Reset cache again. Sales order. Bad example. Doesn't work for HTML fields. <laughs> huh? Doesn't work for HTML. Business partner, partner orders, and uh, I am I am in the wrong place. It's here, placeholder. Yeah, this. Yeah. <coughs> so now, in every in every field on your window, you can put placeholders to guide the user. What is in every, and it works also on fine, I think. Yeah, uh, that's very common in in UI. So Nicolas added a field to do that. It's translatable field. Yeah, so you can put the placeholder in the user language. No, not on system. 
is in column field and the cust user custom field. Yeah. So there are three levels. Yeah. Or no, it's in element too. Let me check. I think it's in element. Yeah, it's in element. So it's in four levels. Element, column, field, and user customization. Usually we add in all the levels. And it always, the, the system takes the high, no, the lower defined, no, the higher defined level. OK. Okay, now let's talk about uh, more things. This this virtual UI was for performance too, but we have made other stuff for performance because that's also very common for implementers to have problems with servers consuming all the CPU. Yeah, everybody has <laughs> heard those complaints. So we added some interesting things. One common problem we had in, in, in some customers was the user comes and launches a process or report. And the process is taking too long time, 10 minutes. And the user is very common. They click refresh. and launch it again. So now that they created two queries in the database. And 10 minutes later, they do it again, and, and they keep. And then you receive the call and say, the server is. So we added this field. With Trek Global, we ask it what to do, and we added this field. This allow multiple execution of this process or report, and we added two options. Uh, it's not all allowed at all, or it's not allowed with the same parameters. Yeah? That is a, maybe the common case, is the user push F, uh, refresh, fill the same parameters, and launch it again. Yeah? Uh, by default, I think we added uh, the second with same parameters. So it's uh, still allowed to run the same report in two windows, but with different parameters. But if you have a report that you know is very expensive on CPU on the database, you can change to the first. And allow the user just to run one at a time, yeah? Not to launch the same report in parallel, OK? And close three closely related to that, we added <coughs> this one. Yeah. There are some processes or reports that are very time consuming. So we added this to force a process or report to run always on background. So uh, it's like this. You have a in voice detail, for example. Suppose this, yeah? This, this report uh, takes a lot of time. So we, we added that the user always has to run this as a background job. That's what the effect of this is that this is checked and read only. The user cannot change it, yeah? Always as background. And they receive the result they select how to. Okay? <coughs> and samely, we can say force a process to run in foreground. It's the opposite, yeah? That is because sometimes we, we have the way to write, uh, we have the way to write processes that in the middle of the process, they ask the user a question. Yeah? We, we have some code uh, in process that calls ask for input. Not, it's not common. In the code, there is not any example. 
but uh, I think that was because somebody required to do a payment transfer, yeah? And when you do a payment transfer, you receive from the bank a TAN code in your cell phone, and you need to ask the user the code to continue the transaction. So we, we added code to do that. And obviously, you cannot, root, you cannot run a process asking input in background. So that's why we also added the force foreground. Yeah. In that case, the user always need to run it in front. And that's performance also. In this also, I don't know if you are aware of this. Um, yeah, I, I cannot make an example of this, but uh, it's something we added. Um, many reports are very Im impactful for the database, yeah? Heavy for the database. And we thought if we have usually replication in Postgres, and it's common practice to replicate the database, why don't we use the replica to execute the reports? Yeah? So the production database don't take the CPU required to do the reports, but the replica server. Yeah? So we thought about that, and finally we created three system configurator. So it's just, yeah, you need to configure the Postgres replication. And in this sysconfig, you tell the system where are the replica servers. And just with that, the, the reports start running on the replica. One is the application server memory, and the second one is the database memory. This just release the database. Yeah, in this one, you will be using the remote data server resources, which is good. So you are yeah. removing that one, but you are still using the application server. Mm -hmm. Memory and, and Java CPU. Yeah. And okay, just that part. Yeah. Okay. You usually you see that when you say Excel reports, for example, time is Java consuming. Not, not, not so much in the I database. Hmm. In, in scenarios, Maybe you need to. I think also Jasper has something like that to create a Jasper server, and you run things on the Jasper server. And also, this is just for the final query on the database. So we, we, we made this, but uh, we, when we tested, it doesn't work for <coughs> financial reports. Yeah. Or it works for financial reports, but it's not useful for that. Because the financial reports does a lot of transactions temporary. in temporary table. And at the end, select the query from the temporary table. We cannot move that to the read-only database, because it's read-only. Yeah? In Postgres, still the replication is, is read-only. So we cannot create temporary tables there. But uh, for many complex reports, this is very good. And release the production server from the database. It's it's, it's mostly by because we have a very flexible reporting engine on Idempier, yeah? Our reporting engine is ad hoc, yeah? The user can do anything. Query things that are not indexed and query tables, yeah, in any way. And so they can impact the database very easily in a report. So this is for that. Um, yeah, and it, it, it has, it works, uh, Postgres has two, day, two ways of do replication. One is 
synchronous and the other is asynchronous. The synchronous replication impacts the times of the server heavily, yeah? Because the every commit needs to be committed on the replica server. And they need to ensure that. So it impacts the times heavily. In the asynchronous replication, we have tested and doesn't have any impact almost. Yeah? So usually we prefer asynchronous replication, but the asynchronous replication can have a lag between the master server and the replica server. Yeah? The network can be slow and you can have some lag between the data of the two servers. Yeah? So this is why we have milliseconds timeouts and iterations. Yeah? Uh, when we throw, uh, launch a report in the idempier, yeah? so it says, OK, there is a replica server goes to the replica server and check if it's in sync, if there is no lag in the data. <coughs> if there is not in sync, then it waits this time and retries these times. Yeah? Keeps retrying, wait, retry, and if the report, so, sorry, the replica doesn't get in sync, then it launch the report from the master. So it's like a try, 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 didn't work, then work with the master. Carlos, if you use the Amazon read replica function, is that a, a synchronous or an asynchronous? Uh, read replica is asynchronous. Amazon, Amazon has two ways. One is multi-AZ, that is synchronous, mm -hmm. but you cannot read that database. Amazon doesn't provide a way to read the multi-AC. Okay. Okay. And the read replicas uh, are asynchronous. But we use this with Amazon, and it works mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah, yeah, okay. Also, uh, uh, you can have a master database with a big server and the replica with a small servers. Mm -hmm. No problem with that. We have used that uh, scenario. Uh, well, there are some technical notes here to avoid problems with Postgres configuration. This probably works with Oracle, but I have never tried it. Oracle also has replication, but I never tested this with Oracle. OK? Ah, this is something I like it a lot. <coughs> C3P0. C3PO, you, you know what is C3PO? Uh, when, when we started, uh, I don't remember, this is Adam Pierre, Adam Pierre maybe. Um, we we use a library for the uh, database connection pool. The library is C3P0. At that time, the library was not so powerful as it is now. Yeah? So recently, we found that the latest changes on C3P0 allows to uh, have a configuration that the application server survives Postgres crash or database crash. Yeah? So it's like this. We have we have here this. Yeah? And uh, let me try this. What if I stop server? <coughs> yes.
Doesn't work, yeah? Uh, the, the user get uh, an error saying that there is no connection, there is no database, yeah? And if I start it again, the server just keep running, yeah? So, now, uh, Amazon has a failover feature, yeah? That you have, when you have multi-AC or replicas, you can say when the master database crash, automatically uh, promote a replica to be the master, yeah? This, this is transparent, not, not transparent because the user sees some errors, but in a matter of seconds, the user is working again without intervention, yeah? The failover will be... In that case, you won't include to some of the session information that you have to re re-log in again? No, I, I am there. But, but if you had the processes running, all those processes are... Yeah. Yeah, okay. roll, roll back and... and your user session is still in memory. Yeah. Yeah, I just open it a new window and the user keeps working. Before this, we configured it, we used this when the Postgres crashed, the Edempier crashed. It was, now it's like, and, and, and the most important is the failover from, from, from database, yeah? So the system can recover from a Postgres crash and keep running without human intervention. <laughs> and it's there. It's just, it's just configuration of the C3P0 properties, yeah? I think we, we documented here what were the changes. I think it was just one, one, one parameter that we used uh, before and change that parameter and shoop, everything worked perfect. Hmm. We also, well, of course, you know, we also, since Java, since the version 6, we change it to Java 11. Uh, HIP made most of the work and also HIP uh, helped us to move from Buckminster to Maven. Taishum. So now the project is running with Java 11 and compiling with Maven. It's a, um, we try to keep, what's the name? State of the art is the English <laughs> name for that. We try to keep with the technology changes. It's not, it's not easy. And also we don't, follow the last, but we just wait. For example, we migrated to Java 11 when Java 12 appeared, yeah? So we are not always in the last, but mostly in the last stable, yeah? Trying to to move, but safely. But the 7.1 release upgrade that is coming soon, I think, uh, what would be the technology <laughs> It's St still the same. I think it brings this new ZK. The ZK changed it. Hmm. But the Java, maybe, is the same. Uh, Jasper. Jasper, Deepak is Deepak? What is Deepak? Deepak. Deepak is working on. on yeah, but but don't know if it, it will arrive to seven. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I think it will not arrive to this version because uh, we are having problems with with uh, collecting all the libraries, and, and that requires every time we change libraries related to Jasper, and that we it requires a lot of tests around. So, 
we will see what happens. But there, there are uh, so many dependencies between hmm. different libraries for previous versions of Poi and data sources of Poi. So Poi is not supporting Java 11. Its current 3.2 version is not supporting Java 11. So we have to upgrade to 4.4. Hmm. Yeah. Java 11 was was a bit painful to to move there, but now it's running fine. But at first was difficult. And if you have plugins that use web services, uh, there are a lot of because Java mm, changed it a lot, modularized it all, it's it dropped it web service from the core, and it's it's hard. Uh, we have had problems in plugins that use web services. Always have some kind of issues with Java 11. So it, if you have plugins that are migrating to Java 11, you need to test carefully web services, <laughs> mostly. OK. Um, <coughs> I call it this <coughs> environment management, yeah? This is something ah, how 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 do you we are we are implementers mostly implementers and user companies needs to keep updates, keep up to date, yeah? That's one thing. But the, the user companies, imagine that you have one problem. Keep up to date your version, your server. And implementers have the same problem by 100. <laughs> yeah? All this, we need to keep up to date the customers. And there are also, um, how do you say that? We can have also distro releases, yeah? Uh, implementers that have a product based on idempere. That would be uh, another class of implementers, yeah? You can have your own product with your theme, with your stuff, with your plugins, and based on idempere, yeah? So all of that we call like, OK, we have an environment or many environments to manage as implementers. And there, there were many things that were very difficult to keep uh, running and, and to keep property properly maintained. Also, we have another problem with the environment, and is the management of multiple um, developer environments testing environments, stage, and production, yeah? That's another kind of, so there is one vertical and another horizontal, but it's kind of same problem. You need to keep your environments synchronized and running without too much effort, yeah? So in past, we have had many issues. I remember always uh, developers, the developer databases run out of sync very quickly. If you have three developers and every developer have database in their laptop, very difficult to maintain that, yeah? So thinking about that, we created a mechanism called automatic packing. The plugins had already the packings, yeah? The packing inside the plugins you, you know that, you create a plugin, when you start the plugin, automatically run packing and create the dictionary entries you need, yeah? That worked perfect for dictionary, but didn't work for tenants, for customers, yeah? So many times you need to create data on the customer side. And that was the missing piece to maintain the environments like uh, synchronized and properly managed. 
So now you have a tool to create packings or create data, configuration data on your customer. For example, garden world, yeah? What I mean is, before we, you, we had a tool to create things on system dictionary, but now we also have a tool to create data on garden world, required for your plugin, yeah? Many times your plugin requires a record in the tax configuration. Hmm? So now we can push that in all the development environments, testing, production, very well tested. And also, we made this tool, automatic external packing. <coughs> okay? Is Practically, is also system configurator keys. So you just say, where are the folders that I need to go and look for the packings? And when the server starts, goes, look for the packings and apply. Yeah? And there is a delay to start, wait, wait some time, retries, timeout, and now. Uh, yeah? So it's. Basically, it's like that. You, you have a folder or several folders separated by com, I think. No, semicolon. <coughs> several folders. And the system goes and looks for those folders and apply any packing is there. And keeps track, yeah? It doesn't reapply something that is already applied. Okay? And there is a naming convention for that. If you want the the packing to be applied on garden world, you need to name the file like what is this? Uh, the file name is timestamp. Yeah, which tenant do I want to apply, and then anything else, whatever. Yeah whatever you want to add to a name. But this is, this is important. The timestamp is to order the packings. Because most of the time, you need to create first the parent data and then the detailed data. And the second part is which tenant to apply. So I say garden world, OK? But we also found that there are installations with 100 tenants, yeah? And we want a mechanism to apply data to all the tenants. So we said, OK, if instead of saying garden world, we said all clients, this packing applies to my 100 tenants in the database. So you just put a pack in, and if all the tenants will have this new tax, for example. It goes tenant by tenant and apply the pack in, in every tenant. Yes? Do you need any interpretation of them for the initial pack in, so your template, let's say? Yes. Before you are applying that one to all the remaining tenants, or it doesn't really matter that maybe you use something different that is not garden work. No, no. Then, mm. I, I, you apply a new tax in all the 100 tenants. So, but what happens if you don't want to apply a new tax, but modify an existing tax? That's more difficult, yeah? So we, we thought about a template tenant where you create the tags in the template tenant and then create the same tags in the 100 tenants, yeah? And then if you come with a second two-pack that modifies that record, yeah, then it works because it modifies the record in the tenant and there is a table, there is a table here, 
is called UUID map. This table keeps the map of the template records with all my 100 records in, in the other tenants, right? So the system can update the tags of the 100. If I did it properly, yeah? If I did it with a template, apply it first the template and then the 100 tenants, okay? So this is all thought to multi-tenant environments and they're hard to manage uh, this kind of situations. But I think we covered it all cases <laughs> in this. Uh, Carlos, another question. To deploy those packets that can only be done indirectly through a plugin, or is there another way to do <coughs> what, what we usually do is we have a repository with the packings. In, in the server, we just pull the repository. And the repository, the folder which, where that repository is, is configured here. Yeah? So it's. So, if I understand you correctly, are you moving away from setting the packings in the plugin? And no, 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 no. No, no, no. The packings in the plugin are for system dictionary. But they don't work for tenant data. It, it, you can use it also for dictionary, but but I think it's mostly thought is for tenants, for tenant data. But sometimes you have data on system that is not related to any plugin, so you can also use this for system. Yeah. Have you considered doing the same for plugins to have a plugin folder that follows through the same architecture? Plugin folder. No. So plugin folders are separate and uh, you can deploy. If you throw plugins there, it auto deploys to IDEA. Um, no. Because it seems so you can have the same architecture where you have that same repository of plugins. Mm -hmm. You have a branch that serves this feature. Just clone that, clone that branch and it gets sucked. Mm. No, no. We, we have not thought about that, but I, I have kind of that in, in Bayern. We have a script that, yeah, it goes to a folder and whatever is there, just install the plugins that I, I find there. So I think it's, uh, you can automate that. Not, not, not difficult, but I think it's, it's something you do before starting the server. No, you, st you start the server, would need to check, Refresh the plugins, restart the server. It's, it's doable with, with uh, scripting. I mean, the server internally, no, not so easy, maybe. Or maybe, could be. Hmm. Yeah, it's possible. We can explore that idea. Would be easier to maintain. Just put the folders, put the plugins there. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> I need to finish um, now. Um, like one last, two last things. Uh, I think Pedro asked for this in previous conference to have a template tenant. Yeah. That was in the wish list of last conference. To have a template tenant, and from this tenant, I can create new tenants, not using the, you know, in, in Edenpeer, you will have a process called it, create new, set up new client. Or, yeah? In this case, we don't have that. We have is a template tenant, and this template tenant have your print formats, your tax configuration, withholdings, whatever you need. And then you use this program to create a new tenant based on the template. Yeah? And it, it, it works. It works. We made it, and it works for two cases. For that, creating a new tenant from a template. And it also works when you want to move a tenant from one database to another database. That's not common, but uh, it works also. Indeed, it started like that 
And then we said, oh, this is copy clients. It's funny, I see Peter call it client copy, we call it copy clients. <laughs> <laughs> and, if, and if you look the class, the Java class, the name is move client, because it has started, was to move from one server to another. And then we said, ah, oh, it's copy. And <laughs> um, that's also for, for multi-tenant, it's key to have this. And when doing that, we found that uh, sometimes you have uh, problems. The UUID is crashing, yeah? colliding. The one database has a record with one UUID, and the second database has the same record with different UUID. So we created a program to allow updating the UUID or the ID, the record ID, yeah? That's also another problem. Sometimes you created a column and it has ID one million, and then the core pushes the same column with, with an ID 50,000, yeah? And they collide. So you can use this program to correct the ID to synchronize the IDs, okay? Mm, what else? We added, uh, we added some code in import event pair to allow uh, creating the database on Postgres RDS directly. We also created a Rung, you know Rung Sync DB is, uh, ah, that's, all, that's also something we did. Uh, integrate all the migration scripts in the installer. So Previously, people needed to install it in pair and then download migration script and apply scripts. Now everything is just run sync DB and it just apply everything, yeah? And we had um, um, multi-tenant installation. No, not multi-tenant. This is another kind of installation. When you have a customer that you sent the customer an installer, but you don't have, you are the implementer, but you don't have access to their server. That makes it difficult to, to make a migration or make a, an upgrade, yeah? So, we created a tool that the name is Monitored Synchronized DB. It's to apply migration scripts but allowing like uh, recovering from errors, yeah? So imagine the case is you have a customer, a bank that they don't allow you to touch their servers and you need to send them the migration script to apply and probably some of the scripts will fail, yeah? So what, what we did is you send the migration scripts the customer run this, run monitor in the B, and says, this is the output. And the output says, these scripts throw this error. So we create a patch for the script and send again. And they run again and send back another error. We create a new patch, send, yeah? Until all the scripts run perfectly, and then you say the customer, now we, this is what you need to migrate stage and production, yeah? So it's a multi -iter iteration work with the customers because you don't have access to their environment, yeah? Uh, which version is working Simply because on the 6.2, I think it's only from 4.2. Yeah, it starts the the scripts starts from 4.1. The script before you need to apply manually. Okay, um, last I want to show you also for multi tenants is I think many people is not aware of this. Uh, you can now have your users giving suggestions about field naming or things like that. So, for
for example, somebody says, no, in this company, warehouse is not warehouse. It's, we call it different. Ah. Yeah? So here is a field, something that is made field suggestions, and the user can come here and suggest, no, it's not warehouse, it's bodega, whatever, yeah? And send the suggestion. And somebody needs to go to a, a special window and review the suggestions from users. Let's simulate this. The administrator comes here and says, ah, this user suggested to change the name of this field to this name. And we can compare the difference. Yeah, this is the difference. And we can say reject, sorry, or accept. And when we accept the field suggestion, it says, you want to change it at element or at field? Yeah? And, uh, yes, that the, the name will be changed in all windows or whatever. Yeah? There is also the tool that the user can hear. You know the context help here? Uh, it's, uh, it's an idea to document the process that the user must do here. So the user, or this can be a user or a documenter person, can create context help here directly in HTML. And similar, we have here a, an approval process for the context help. Okay? I think that's all. <laughs> I took. Uh, <laughs> No? Have a question? This is for installation or uh, con context? Uh, no, it's for for tenants. Uh, well, the field, the field is for element or field. Yeah, the context help is general or by tenant. If you click here, is tenant specific. The, f the field is element or field, yeah, not tenant. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> Just a, a small present for you. <laughs> nice. It's, it's for your future uh, white knight <laughs> to the MPF. Thank you.